Hi, I'm Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship Reformed Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current issues. And tonight's subject is Bible translations. Now that may not be an exciting, titillating subject to you, but it's a very, very important subject. Uh, we live in a time when uh, more and more translations are coming out almost every six months there's a new translation. Uh, many of them are very bad, most of them are very bad, and the translation which has really kind of taken the, the world by storm, the New International Version, version is not a very good translation actually. It's actually worse than the Old King James, so we're going to talk about that tonight. You know, uh, a good question that people really ought to know, in, in what languages were the Old and New Testaments originally given? Well, Brian, this is important. Uh, you know, as I was looking back on the 90 shows, this is number 91, actually, that we've done. We've never really done one on Bible translations, and uh, I thought it would be good for us to consider the subject, and particularly with the, uh, the furor that uh, is, has been caused by a, a new, uh, a startling re revelation uh, concerning the New International Version. We'll have more to say about that in just a few moments, so stay tuned if you haven't heard about that. But anyway, in what language uh, were the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments uh, originally given? Uh, actually, th there were three, uh, primarily two, the Hebrew in the Old Testament, and uh, the New Testament was given in the Greek language. Uh, there is also another language that's used, uh, approximately nine or ten chapters of the Old Testament were written in uh, Aramaic, which was the language of Babylon, also called uh, Syriac. Uh, uh, in, and I'd like to just show this. Um, in uh, Daniel 2, for instance, um, uh, here in, in Daniel 2, there's the recounting of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream, um, and then he, uh, uh, he, he brought Daniel to try to show the meaning of the dream, and it's a very important and fascinating chapter. But there's something that takes place, actually, in the text of Daniel that would be unnoticed uh, by the, uh, the English reader, unless uh, there was a footnote uh, to that effect, and some of the Bibles do contain a footnote here. But in Daniel 2 and verse uh, 3 we read, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. So there is uh, specifically one of the biblical language, uh, languages mentioned by name in the text of the Bible. Um, languages are mentioned in, in other places as well. Uh, it, it speaks about uh, uh, the, the people um, uh, of Israel after they'd come back uh, or come to the Promised Land. And uh, as uh, time went on, they began to speak different dialects of Hebrew uh, so that uh, uh, there was a, a case where uh, the, the soldiers of the um, uh, opposing armies were told by the pronunciation of the word shiboleth or siboleth. Now those were, were Hebrew uh, words and those are just simply different ways of pronouncing Hebrew words. In Luke uh, chapter 23 and verse 38, uh, we read about the crucifixion of our Lord on the cross at Calvary and we read this, and a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And so here the, the languages of the Bible are mentioned uh, by name. But the, the whole point is that the Bible was not given to us in modern uh, 20th century conversational English. God did not choose to give the Bible uh, in English. And again, he did not choose to give the Bible in uh, every language of the world. Now surely this was not due to any defect in God's omniscience. The Bible teaches that God is omniscient. He knows all things. Uh, he knows uh, uh, even the insignificant things of life. He knows the very number of the, the very heads, hairs of our head, for instance. So it's not because uh, God couldn't have done this. He could have. But he chose to give the Bible in the Hebrew and the Old Testament a very beautiful language that's very suited to description, to uh, historical narratives. Um, uh, it, it's very poetic, as you can see, even reading an English translation of the, the poetical books like the Psalms and the Proverbs. And then he chose to give the New Testament in Greek, and Greek with its 
um, six different verb tenses, and it's uh, uh, four or five declensions of nouns in uh, the Koine Greek at the time of, uh, of the New Testament. And with all of its, its subtle um, uh, variations in uh, declensions and in tenses, you know, it's perfectly suited to convey uh, subtle uh, theological distinctions. And sometimes uh, the, the uh, New Testament writers will actually build an entire argument upon the difference between a singular and a plural noun. And so the, the languages are very important, but they were given uh, in basically Hebrew and Greek. Now, uh, many Christians cannot speak Hebrew and Greek, Greek um, and so that's why we're going to be talking about translations tonight. But Brian, you know, another <coughs> thing that um, we should talk about a little bit here is, uh, you know, we haven't really had printing all that long. I mean, uh, so many advances are being made in printing. Uh, you and I have... Uh, printers on our desktops, you know, in our offices. But, you know, there was a day when uh, uh, there, we didn't have printing presses, you know, before uh, Johann Gutenberg and all of that. How were the scriptures transmitted uh, before the days of printing? Well, all the uh, ancient texts were, of course, uh, carefully transmitted by hand, uh, generally with a, a probably a quilt that used by monks in the Middle Ages, of course, and then the ancient Hebrews also uh, using an instrument where they would, uh, they would have a room full of Jews or whatever, and they would sit there and they would very carefully, by hand, copy out the Hebrew text. Very, very, very carefully, very slowly, very deliberately. It was checked, it was double-checked. Very, very accurate, very, very accurate. And then, of course, uh, the Greek text, the New Testament being in Greek, the Greek text, uh, many of the manuscripts were done in monasteries where you would have a room full of monks and you would have a person uh, standing there, and he would read very slowly from the manuscript, and each monk would write down the word. Now, uh, there are literally thousands of Greek manuscripts, the Greek New Testament, Koine Greek it's called, and uh, it was the typical Greek language spoken in the first century. There are thousands and thousands of manuscript, manuscripts uh, that go uh, from a very early time all the way until the Reformation period. There is what's called the majority text, which is what the King James is based on, and there are many more of those, that thus it's called the majority text. And then there's the minority text, which uh, uh, there's not as many of them. And the thing to emphasize is, is that even little minor variations that were made by the copyist, you know, there are little mistakes. They don't affect doctrine. They're very minor. They're usually a, a, a wrong letter. They're almost always very easy to see and spot. They're very, very minor. They don't affect the Bible as the Word of God. And you may be thinking, well, you know, God is sovereign. Why didn't God just give us the original manuscripts? Why didn't God, uh, you know, have the letters of the Apostle Paul survive? And uh, the reason for that is very good because people would probably worship those manuscripts. They would probably become, uh, they'd be, receive adoration and worship. And uh, God wanted us to receive it the way we, he passed it on through history. And what we have today is totally reliable, totally reliable, and it is the Word of God. You know, sometimes, Brian, uh, people will say, you know, well, all of these old copies, you know, one was copied from another, and then another one was copied from that, and, and, and it just renders the whole thing unreliable. It's like the game of telephone. Yeah. Well, we have, see, what, what we have is, it's called textual criticism, where uh, scholars, they go back and they examine all these texts, and we know basically when they were written and when they, where they came from, what part of the world. And when all these texts are examined and compared with the earliest manuscripts and so forth, we see that they're actually very, very reliable. For example, uh, recently, around the 1940s, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea, Scroll, the Dead sea Scrolls go way back, and they had um, portions of Isaiah and different books of the Old Testament. And if you compare those to what we have in our Bible today, the accuracy is absolutely amazing. God has preserved his word. It's accurate, it's dependable. And like I said, there are very, very minor little variations, and they're usually quite easy to tell, and that's what textual criticism is about. I'm not talking about higher criticism, where people take these ridiculous liberal theories, uh, you know, that this guy wrote this and this guy wrote that. I'm talking about looking at the Greek text, looking for minor variations, and trying to decipher what happened here. And it's very, very interesting. For example, as we talked about in one show, the book of Revelation, some of the ancient manuscripts, instead of having 666, they have 616. 
Well, we discover that in the Latin spoken, and these are from the manuscripts from the Latin speaking part of the Roman Empire, we discover that 616 was the Latin equivalent of Nero Caesar. But in Hebrew, it's 666. So there was a monk trying to kind of help his readers understand that it was going to be Nero Caesar, you see. But all the texts are reliable, and we have a very reliable, very, very good Bible. And that takes us to a question that you need to answer that is very appropriate to what I was just talking about. May a translation of the Bible, because I've heard this too, well, it's in English, it's not in Hebrew, it's not in Greek, how can it be reliable? May a translation of the Bible properly be called the Word of God, and were there any approved translations of the Bible in use during the Bible times? Well, Brian, this is a very important question, and, and just before we answer it, I just want to emphasize to any that may be uh, unfamiliar with this important subject that uh, it's not the case that we have literally thousands of these Greek manuscripts and one was copied from another and then another from that one and another from that one and so we, we have like thousands of generations. That's not the case. Rather, uh, you know, as Brian was saying, oftentimes uh, uh, the scripture would be read in what was called a scriptorium and uh, various copyists would, would all be sitting there copying basically off of the same manuscript. And so we're not talking about uh, many hundreds or thousands of generations of manuscripts between us and the, the original autographs which have disappeared, but uh, we're talking about relatively few. And uh, the, the science of textual criticism is a very fascinating study, but uh, we can have a high degree of confidence uh, that what we have in our English Bibles is the Word of God. But let's just consider the subject of a translation for a moment. And I think the question that Brian asked is, is a good one. It's a fair uh, question. Uh, you know, there are religions in the world that actually teach that you have to learn the uh, original language that, that of their holy book uh, before you can read it. Um, now, there are some uh, English translations of the, the Quran, the uh, uh, holy book of the Muslims, for instance, but uh, those, are not, uh, th those are not generally circulated without the original Arabic uh, uh, being right alongside it. But God, I don't believe... Uh, intends that every single Christian study Hebrew and Greek. Definitely, if you have gifts in this area, that study is encouraged. It's a fascinating study. You don't have to be a minister to study Hebrew or Greek. As a matter of fact, uh, if you have an interest in this area, go and, and talk to your pastor. Ask him to teach you the Greek alphabet. Ask him to teach you how to sound out words so that you can uh, go maybe to an interlinear translation where there's a, uh, the Greek text and then right under it a, a very literal word-for-word -word rendering of that Greek uh, uh, and it, so that you can actually read the words yourself. That would be good. Uh, Brian and I would be happy to sit down and, and uh, uh, give you some pointers in the Greek language. Uh, give us a call. We'd be happy to talk to you about that. But yes, there were actually uh, translations that were in use in Bible times. And we don't have time to develop this because we, there, we do want to get to the NIV story in just a few moments. But for instance, in the Old Testament, it sp spoke about... Uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ in a prophetic way, and it said, Mine ear hast thou pierced. And in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, when that's quoted, it, they actually are quoting from the Septuagint, which was the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. And uh, that is quoted in the Hebrew, or, or I'm sorry, in the book of Hebrews, and instead of, My, my ear hast thou pierced, it's a body thou hast prepared for me. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's a fascinating uh, difference in, in uh, uh, the, the psalm as compared to the, the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Basically, uh, both of those things are getting at the same idea that, that cr Jesus Christ had a real physical body. And it's like uh, uh, the, the, uh, the potter that digs in uh, to make little impressions for the ears. My ear has thou pierced. That's, that's uh, a pictorial way. Uh, of speaking of the preparation of the body. So yes, uh, oftentimes in the, uh, in the New Testament, not all the time, but oftentimes the uh, Old Testament quotes are out of the Septuagint version, a, a Greek translation rather than directly from the, the biblical Hebrew. 